Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Wolf. And I'm Michael Hall. Welcome to Innovation Coffee, brought to you by ARM, where every week we take a deep dive into the ARM developer ecosystem with special guests and topics that bring you the latest innovations happening in, on, and around the ARM architecture. We've got a great show today. We've got the founder of Project Bluefin, the containerized Linux desktop, and uh, currently doing developer relations at the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and a really, really old friend of mine who I am so excited to have back on. We've got George Castro joining us here just a little bit. And remember, Innovation Coffee is a interactive show. We encourage the audience to participate. So if you have any questions or comments during the show, go ahead and drop them right in the YouTube chat, and uh, we'll bring them up to our guests here live on the show. Before we do that, if you do like the show and you don't want to miss our future episodes, make sure that you like and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you get the latest that's happening. We do innovation coffee, we do ARM TVs, we do all kinds of stuff. So like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of that. Now, before we bring our guest in, let's uh, let's talk about last week's show. Robert, do you want to go over what uh, we who we had on and what we talked about? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get his name right again this time. Uh, but yeah, we spoke with Yosef or Yosef Holzmayer. Uh, from Mender IO. And so uh, Mender IO handles over the year updates for IoT devices. Uh, pretty cool uh, episode. I think I had a lot of fun talking with him, learned a lot um, about their services, the product that they're offering. And of course, um, just kind of a, the work that goes into, you know, over the year updates for these massive you know, IoT column, you know, grids or mesh networks that they have going on. And so, uh, um, I had a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know. Were there any takeaways for you, Michael, from last week's episode that you remember? So I've been in IoT for a long time, and this is just like a constant problem anybody building IoT devices has. Is how do you keep them up to date in the field? How do you make sure that those updates aren't going to fail and like brick your million dollar equipment that you've got out there? So for me, it's always exciting to see how people are tackling this problems and uh, you know how things have progressed over the years. Partitioning apparently for for yeah. vendor. <laughs> I mean, you know, has been used in mobile for a long time. Yeah. Um, exciting to see that uh, being used out in the IoT space as well. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. Well, I think today's episode, uh, you know, about containerized Linux desktops um, sounds like a lot of fun as well. And uh, we have George on the call waiting for us. So maybe we should bring him in and let's learn about uh, who George is and talk about Bluefin. Hey, George. Hello. George. Thanks for having me on. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. So, um, George, I know that you and Michael have a, a, a big track record here. So I, I want to kind of play, uh, what is it? B backseat. I'll play backseat, uh, you know, uh, co-host for, for this episode and let you and Michael kind of go at it here. Uh, but you know, we usually like to get to know you first and since yeah. you and Michael already know each other very well, I'm going to be the one who asks been you for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who you are. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to know who you are. So, so Jorge, you know, give us your origin story here. Who, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, so um, I grew grew up mostly settled in Michigan. I was like an army brat. I got my first computer when I was ten, TRS eighty Model Four. Been kind of uh, been kind of a technology nerd uh, most of my life. High school did a lot of BBSing. Uh, started with Linux in nineteen ninety four. Actually, uh, when my friend gave me a stack of Slackware floppies, and at the time I was really big into OS two. Uh, went to Michigan State University. Uh, did a bunch of nerd stuff there, um, but was mostly doing army. Th I, I after college, I went into the army for four years. Um, so I did that for a little bit. Stationed down in beautiful Fort Irwin, California, which is like the middle of the desert. Um, mm -hmm. Got out. Never kind of lost my passion for technology. And during that time, I was running Linux. So I had old Red Hat. Remember Mandrake Linux? I've, I've kind of That's kind of right. had. I've used them all uh, by then. And uh, got out, got involved in tech support, and eventually ended up at uh, a university in Michigan in Rochester Hills called Oakland University that was moving from Unix to Linux. And back then, this was when uh, organizations were really starting to pick up Linux. And uh, that's when I started to get involved in GNOME and Linux itself. And then I got an email from a friend that said, hey, we're starting this new Linux distribution thing is called no name yet.com. I went there and then my friend said, Hey, change your app sources list to this thing. So I did, and I did a live disk upgrade and uh, this Brown desktop came up and uh, it was the first Ubuntu. So that, that was pretty cool. I ended up 
uh, becoming a part of the early Ubuntu community and eventually actually worked for Canonical uh, for a very long time. And that's where I met Michael. Um, so did a lot of developer relations there. Ended up moving to cloud. Michael and I went through the Unity transition together. So that was- Oh like, yeah, that was fun times. So that, was, that was some funding. Um, moved, moved over over to cloud where I, uh, I've, I've always kind of been into infrastructure also, even though I was kind of doing desktop-y things at Canonical. So things like Puppet um, and, and so on. And I worked on a project called Juju for a little while on the Ubuntu server uh, piece. And then one of my, one of my coworkers at the time, uh, Chuck, showed me Kubernetes and it kind of really changed my life. Uh, so I spent about the last year there at Canonical trying to convince them to go more all in on Kubernetes. Uh, then I, at a KubeCon, I ran into two of the co-founders of Kubernetes and they were doing Heptio, which is a startup on Kubernetes. And that also changed my life. Got very involved in the Kubernetes community, uh, eventually uh, acquired by VMware. And then uh, I did that for a little bit. That's where I learned a bunch of this enterprise stuff. Uh, did v got out, did VC for a while, uh, did a few startups, one uh, around Cloud Custodian, which is an open source thing that you should be running in your clouds. It saves you money. And then I took a sabbatical for a while, kind of trying to find, you know, what am I going to do next in my career? One of those moments. And um, me and some friends started what became Universal Blue and Project Bluefin kind of when I was off. Uh, so that was about three months uh, and then eventually a friend from Kubernetes came back and says, hey, let's get, the, let's get the party going again. I need you at the CNCF. I need you to do what you did for Kubernetes for 180 other projects. So that's where I am now. So I'm staff and I help coordinate um, getting community members lined up with like their governance and all the projects, everything from Kubernetes, the project, Prometheus to the sandbox ones that are just starting uh, to get into that. So I'm, I, I see myself more of a zookeeper these days and I kind of, uh, you know, one of the people tasked with maintaining the, the garden where the open source projects kind of thrive. So you don't own one project. You own, like, you're responsible for helping all of them there. Yeah, it's pretty tough. How yeah. are you in CF now? I keep seeing the landscape document and, like, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, so I, that's how I start my workday. Every day I go there and there's a pull, re there's pull requests where people are updating the statuses of their projects and things like that. And I use, I actually use it as a way to see what's hip and what people are building. Um, but the explosion of open source software is just so intense. Not only is there a CNCF landscape, but there are other landscapes as well. There's one for Wasm AI and stuff. We actually have a landscape of landscapes now. <laughs> of course so, we do. We're getting very meta, very meta on that one. But I mean... You've been around. There's new open source stuff every single day. Um, every day. So, you know, those of us that like work in these foundations and things like that, we're trying to keep it, you know, everything nice and organized. So you support what we can and just kind of keep the party going is the is the kind of mantra that we're shooting for there. Nice. Well, so, George, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah. thank you for, Sorry, was that for, too long? No, that was perfect. Yeah, no, right. that was perfect introduction. So, yeah. you know, now. CNCF. Um, but that's not why we brought you on here, uh, is it? We brought you on it isn't. for uh, it your isn't. project Bluefin, which yeah. is uh, really interesting and nice to see uh, you back in the desktop world of things. Yeah, yeah I, th I think you gave us the perfect segue. In fact, uh, you know, let's let's dive into Bluefin, right? Like this is the yeah. main segment. So maybe starting off for anyone who has no idea what Bluefin is, you know, tell us like what you know what is Project Bluefin? It's something you came up during your came up with during your sabbatical, or you worked with some buddies on during your sabbatical. Yes, yeah. the, the sticker you gave me at, at KubeCon was awesome. It's like a dinosaur yeah. feathered dinosaur looking. Whole, uh, there, there it is. Thing, yeah, yeah. So, so what is Project Bluefin? You know, like give us the give us the high level there. Yeah, so I wanted a better Linux desktop. You know, I worked in in Linux desktop before, but also cloud. And then now that I've only been working in cloud, um. I was growing increasingly frustrated that uh, the Linux desktop was being left behind, especially by like all my open source buddies who work on some of the most sophisticated software, like in the entire industry. And um, the Linux desktop just isn't working for them. Right. So I found myself in a sea of Macs with like a handful of other people like Josh Burkis and, you know, a, a few other people. And 
if you stand at KubeCon and you look at all these booths and things like that, it's like, wait a minute. I, why, why can't I have all of this, you know? Uh, so I was kind of struggling with it at the time. And as Michael knows, making Linux distributions is hard. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of them. And like, it's just, it's just this exercise and frustration. Um, so it was always something you wanted to do, right? It's like, you know, if I had the resources that, you know, Mark put in Ubuntu, what would the perfect Linux desktop look like? What if I was in charge, right? And you could do that. It's just hard. Yeah. So at KubeCon in Detroit, uh, I ran into Colin Walters, who's one of the engineers on Fedora Core OS. And um, he had been working on taking a thing called OS Tree, which I don't have the time, time to get into right now, but shoved it into an OCI container as a transport mechanism, which basically means you can create a custom image of Fedora using cloud tools. So uh, Marco and I, over the weekend, we created a Docker file and then it said from Fedora Silver Blue. And then I changed the wallpaper, right? With like, I copied a wallpaper, copy, you know, or whatever. And then I, I used my little decom skills there to set the wallpaper. And then we put it in GitHub and you know, a five gig container came out the other end. Uh, and then I rebased my laptop to it and then I had it. So then, you know, a few people sent pull requests. And every time we do that, we had to learn to GitHub Actions. You rebuild the container, uh, just like you would, you know, when you're making a container on GitHub using an action and my operating system would get updated. So we kind of decided, you know, I was kind of like, wow, this is this is really neat. And obviously the server implications of being able to, you know, declare your workload and your core operating system in a container file like that. I tell that to people and they just, everyone kind of knows that's like awesome, right? But I was more interested in uh, catching up the Linux client to the to the rest of Linux because I already knew the server stuff, right? I already use Flatcar, CoreOS is a thing. Like these have been around for a long time. So I was kind of like, you know, it's time for the Linux desktop to have its Docker moment. It never had its Docker moment. So uh, yeah, so we totally flipped the consumption model of Fedora Silver Blue into into more of a cloud native approach so that's where all the verbiage and things like that come on the website which is you declare what you want in your container file and you have images and then you have your buddy on the image and then it only takes one or two linux smart people to have a nice managed experience so we we add a thin little atomic layer and in order to build that we had to make base images that support different desktops and different versions and and things like that uh, which leads me to ARM, which is the uh, the architecture that I've been getting asked for the most. Usually, you know, Ed from Equinix was like, "I need an ARM image." Like on day two, he asked me. Um, so I've been kind of working through that and and trying to figure that out. So now that GitHub has ARM builders, this should help us and hopefully leverage some of the work by the Asahi Linux project, which is built on Fedora. So it just so happens that Fedora also happens to be one of the great places where like Asahi bases, base, bases their OS on. So all of that work to enable like the Mac, the M chips and stuff like that. Um, we're hoping to leverage that as a base image and then be able to do Bluefin. So that's kind of the infrastructure, but Bluefin is just meant to be uh, two things, uh, a Chromebook kind of replacement where you give it to a friend as a browser, whatever apps they need, and then it's fully automated with updates and it's atomic. Um, no uh, distro package breakage or any of that stuff. And then Bluefin DX is our developer image where I'm doing things like VS Code and a bunch of developer tools that you're probably going to ask me about. And that one is more for, th that's really the passion for me, which is like when I'm at KubeCon and I see all this stuff, I want a platform to be able to mess with all of that thing. So that's that's kind of the mantra so far. So now we know about Bluefin. What? <laughs> now we know about Bluefin. And for yes. everyone who has more questions, I mean, like you guys, you guys have an amazing website. I mean, check Thanks. out Bluefin.io, right? That's that's the place to go. Yeah, Project Bluefin.io. Project Bluefin.io. There yeah, it is. Yeah, and it kind of kind of tells our mantra there. Uh, Brian Kettleson uh, has been one of the people. There's a bunch of people who've been helping me out, but Brian Kettleson's kind of been driving the developer experience for me because, um you know, developers are very picky. So it's hard to pick like the one tool 
right? Because it's like, what does your perfect developer environment look like? You're going to get 30 different answers. So hundreds. It's all about choice, right? What? It's all about choice. It's about choice. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, we strive. We, you know, my, my goal is like, if you have a Bluefin machine and you want to get into cloud native, like you're always going to have the best stuff. Right. And that's, that's where we, that's what we're striving uh, to get to. So it includes kind, you can fire up a cluster. Uh, we include VS code in the DX images with a dev container pattern. My, my, the idea there is like, I'm just getting into the industry. You meet someone at like a Kubernetes meetup and say, yep, this is what you want. You want this thing with dev containers and a kind cluster and you hook them up and then they kind of start from there and move up as opposed to struggling, trying to set things up manually. So a lot of the things we do are trying to get, trying to connect things um, to work better together. Great. All right. Well, so um, now we know about Bluefin. That's great. I love it. Um, I, I actually was watching your video on the website and uh, was watching you kind of through the setup. And yeah. so I noticed that in the setup, you have these nice little check boxes. One time you're like, oh, and for those of you who or well, gosh, what was it about the developers and, and Microsoft and uh, was it Office? For those of you who want Office, oh, no, oh, no yeah. one does. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just great video. Um, yeah. I'm curious about what the package management system looks like, because this is something that that, you know, in the setup, it looks like you're kind of getting your packages set up in there. Yeah. You're getting some dependencies squared away. But yeah. what does the overall package management system look like? And then, you know, in watching the video, I also noticed that you have a new command that I haven't seen before the apt get or the yum of sorts, which is just, is that, is that sort of, okay. Sort of. Yeah. So maybe you could explain this a little bit package management and you know what this new command that I've never seen before is. Yeah. So package management on the host, I'm trying to get rid of that. Okay. Like, I don't, you know, uh, it's like I have my operating system and then it updates, you know, and it gives me my desktop. And what we do is we put you on a rolling tag and kind of do your upgrades uh, for you there in the background. There are times when you do have to do package management at the system level. If you need to do a VPN and they don't provide you a WireGuard config and you might have to install that. Uh, so the manage the hybrid package manager is called, it's called RPM OS tree, which lets you actually take any of the RPMs out there from Fedora, you know, and, and third parties and things like that and layer them onto the image itself that's on your laptop. Usually what we do is we do that for you because it's kind of annoying and technical and, and we're trying to get you set up working out of the box. So if there's any software out there, that long tail of stuff that you need in RPMs, usually you might need to add that to our image. Uh, the bummer about that is when you do that, it makes updates a little bit slower and things like that. But generally speaking, uh, that's happening in the background anyway. So we're trying to move away from package management and more towards getting your workloads and containers. So uh, the OS itself, hopefully you're not doing it. Unfortunately, right now, you probably still have to do some if you're, you know, if you're digging in. Yeah, thank you. Package management on the host is the last resort. And um, so we want to get you into, into containers. Just, uh, the URL for that is just.systems, by the way, is a, soft, is a piece of software that I actually found uh, from a coworker that's used in, a bunch of server projects. It's like make, you just write a little, you know, you say what you want the command to be, and then you can inline scripts or you could do commands. So we actually, you, we didn't want to do a bluefin cuddle or bluefin control, uh, right? So we didn't want to write a thing, but usually when we're, when we're tying all these things together, you, you might have to do like post boot config or here's a script you have to run. And we don't want to, dump a bunch of uBlue dash scripts in user bin either. So we just leveraged just, and then we started making commands. So when you type just update, it will do the RPM OS tree update. It'll do the flat path update. It will update all your containers. That way you just have one alias. And what we just, this is a pattern we discovered is uh, it's like a shared alias file for everyone running on the system. So over time, people have been like, man, this is really annoying to have to run a, you know, a Docker system prune. Right. So we have a just clean command that, you know, kind of just does that for you and then a bunch of other stuff. So the, the community started to uh, add, add those kind of things. So in, in lieu of making our own tool, we just kind of leverage just to do that. And I love the tool in general. So 
you know, I'm, I hope I'm glad when people tell me that they're just discovering just that, that, that makes me happy. Just, just, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if I go to a project and they have a just file and you read that just file, I could get up and going in five minutes. It's fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I love cool. this. Sound effect, just, just update. Like that's what you're yelling at your computer anyway. May as yeah. May as what you type into it. Yeah. Yeah. But then we had to do more complicated things. So we had to make a wrapper. So now it's called you just, but hopefully you don't have to deal with that. Uh, what we do now is we just landed. This is when you first open your terminal, we give you like a MOTD that kind of tells you type you just, and you'll see all the commands. And then we have little tips, a message of the day. It's like that dynamic MOTD we tried to do in Ubuntu, Michael, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know, with, with our, with our tips on there. Nice. So George, you have been running bare metal Linux on desktops and laptops since just about the, the dawn of time, right? You know how to make packages. You know how to create your own uh, dev or app to repo. Uh, so you could have done the traditional route and uh, you know packaged all of this software that you want that way. What made you decide to go with containers instead? Containers are the way. That's just how rest of Linux is. And I was frustrated that uh, it, it wasn't as native on, on the desktop. So I, I skipped it entirely. Um, and also we can't build this with traditional packages. We could, but it would take way more people, uh, with, with different packaging skills. Uh, so most of you are bluefin when it started out, it was kind of like janky bash. And then people over time have been replacing it. Uh, so it's just, it kind of lowers, it lowers the barrier when, when Fedora decided, you know, to use the container pattern, that I think what is what really unlocks everything. The technology itself is just, you know, that's just a thing. Uh, but in it, by making it so all you needed was a container file to modify your OS, it allowed people like me to get in there and kind of give people the experience that they wanted. Which so is hard, it's hard to do in in a distro. I'm glad you mentioned the Fedora uh, project because. Bluefin's not the first attempt at making a containerized Linux desktop, is it? Yeah, actually, Jess Frizzell was doing doing this in 2015. She had a blog post about it using Docker containers for all her graphical apps and stuff. So, so what, what were some of the lessons that you've learned from these projects that came before you? And how has that kind of affected your approach in Bluefin? Oh, man, that's, that's a great question. Um, adapting the things that we do on server to desktop is has been interesting for me because if <clears throat> like if you hand one of these to someone who's like a kubernetes nerd or whatever and explain it to them they're like oh this is really great and then they're up and running in 20 minutes because mm -hmm. uh, working on this kind of side of the industry it's people are used to like docker run nginx or whatever right but when you show it to kind of traditional linux users um they're kind of used to you know apt get install nginx and then they set up their you know they go in and they double click and get a server up and, or, you know, do, do all that kind of stuff. Whereas in, in our side of the house, we're kind of trying to automate, automate as much as possible and, and get as much eph ephemeralism. I don't know the containerisms uh, kind of front and center because no one, no one was really doing that. And I, I felt there was a need to, you know, what if we were to start over you know, but instead of distro nerds, it's distro nerds with cloud nerds and the cloud pattern is what we're shooting for. Um, I'm thinking your community here, uh, uh, George, I think these are people you must have brought in from, from your discord here because yeah. uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're, uh, they're pretty, pretty excited. This is awesome. Yeah. And there's Mark Russell. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Yeah, The, the excitement Hello, around the red hatters and Fedora people have been amazing as well, because uh, I don't know if you remember Fedora Atomic Workstation was around for a very, very long time. Like, and it was kind of, I think they kind of killed it at some point. And it, it was this native OS tree and it's the same technology. All they did, I don't, I don't want to trivialize the amount of work they're putting into this, but all they did is at the very end and sa said, and just shove it into an OCI container, right? So all of our distribution tools, our registries, you can run gripe or any of your scanner tools on the containers. You can copy them around using all the same tools so that all of, all of a sudden we didn't go in, you know, having to write a bunch of management tools around that. You could just use GitHub, any, anything that could do a Docker file and Podman run or Podman build or Docker build 
is doing. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, your your desktop has the same ecosystem of tools around it to to manage those artifacts that servers have had for a long time. So that I felt like that helped us really accelerate in the amount of stuff that we can do uh, compared to doing that stuff from scratch. Awesome. So um, I have a question here, just kind of regarding the, the the tools and the bring up process. You know, I, I watched that video; it was really nice, the one on your on your website. But um, mm -hmm. maybe you could just kind of walk me through this, uh, uh, along with maybe highlighting some of the most used or most desirable or let's just say most robust tools available on Bluefin. Yeah. So uh, the question is like, you know, what are some key developer tools that are enabled on Bluefin out of the box? Yep. Um, and then maybe you could just kind of like walk us through that, that board bring up, not that board bring up, I'm so used to bringing up boards, the OS yeah. bring up or, or the bring up for Bluefin. Yeah. Um, you know, when yeah. you first, when you first get that image on there and, and how, how are you going to experience that? Right. So when you do the installer, which is, we're in the middle of getting a new installer, because uh, that's probably the weakest point right now. Uh, so we're waiting on that. So I'm going to start from, you're going to have a horrible installer experience for the next, you know, few weeks. But, you know, when, once it gets up and going, uh, you're in normal Bluefin. And what we do is we kind of default to just that image. And then people like us, you'll, uh, when you open the terminal, you'll type just dev mode. And then that will transparently switch you to what we call the developer experience image. And that has the following tools on it. Um, so the first one that we picked that we had to have was Visual Studio Code. Uh, and at first we set you up with like a pod band setup and all that stuff. But as the months went on, uh, it became apparent that people really missed having the kind of Docker experience with that ecosystem of tools. So for VS Code, uh, we, we, we started including Docker on the image as well. Uh, and then we turn on the Docker socket and then we set up VS Code to come up with the dev containers extension already pre-installed. So when you click on VS and we put it on the dock for you, right? Because after you switch to dev mode, it's like you're mine, right? So you click on VS Code and then it comes up and then blam, you can do your first dev container. And then you hit control shift P, new container. And then they give you that list of dev containers pick Python or whatever, you hit enter and it goes. Uh, other people made made sure that like the thing isn't spamming you all the time with like, you know, install the Docker extension. So we just did all that for you. Um, so there's that. And that kind of handles the VS code containerized experience. Um, the second thing that we added was a tool called DevPod. This is from Loft, the folks at loft.sh, which... You can connect to VS Code and things like that. This gives you that workspaces experience um, in GitHub, but you can run it on any cloud. And it also uses dev containers. Dev containers are kind of the thread that we use to connect all these tools together because we want to have opinions, but we also don't want to be like, these are the five things you have, and then that's it. Um, this is very useful as well, like at home. Uh, like Brian uses it to connect to his home lab, so his laptop isn't doing any container development. And it's just, it's a nice little GUI. You click on the cloud you want and it connects your IDE and then you're off to the races. It's it's pretty awesome. Uh, and includes bare metal and SSH because we wanted to include things like VS Code and stuff, but we want our target audiences on every cloud. So we're also trying to do that. Uh, the next one that we include is called DevBox. This is a very interesting one that we ran into. This is more of a Durham based. It uses Nix in the back end and... What what people like about this one is in your project directory, like when you CD to it, there's like a little file and you add all your dependencies and all that kind of stuff. And it just transparently installs a bunch of Nick stuff that you can only access from that directory. And then they have this like whole little cool toolkit and all this kind of stuff. One of the Bluefin developers, Robert, actually uses Nix at work, but he's in that weird situation where he's like, I'm the only person that uses Nix. And all the other people are container people. So DevBox has a export to dev container uh, option. So that lets him do his Nix thing and he's happy, but still work with a group of people using that dev container pattern. Um, and it also, when people complain, you know, why aren't you using Nix for everything? It's like the greatest thing ever. I'm like, here you go. Leave me alone. Um, so we have that one. And then uh, the last one is the one I'm really interested in is Homebrew I had switched to uh, OCI packages about two years ago when Bintray went away. And 
they actually run all of their packaging and everything out of GitHub and you can watch their actions and then they just push them to the registry. So I wanted to use Brew because when I was talking to people, all the Linux server people, like the only people who don't use Brew on Linux are Linux desktop people, which I've always found very interesting uh, because in Cloudland, all the, that's, that's just what everybody uses and everything is on there. And I wanted that ecosystem. Uh, so for about four months, we had homebrew just installed on the host and you would just brew install what you want. Uh, but then at some point, uh, it, they started to pull in libraries and those would conflict with the system. And I asked around, it's like, ah, oh, we're going to have to containerize this. So what we're working on now is called Bluefin CLI, which is a perfect container that has brew in it. And you launch it via this terminal that Christian Hergert at Red Hat wrote this. It's called the prop terminal, which looks a lot like WS, like, you know, in WSL, you have Ubuntu and all of those things. Uh, you basically did that. Uh, but natively on Linux. So all of these containers that we're asking people to go into instead are now available in your terminal. So when you sit on a plane next to me and I have my Ubuntu terminal open, it looks like I'm using Ubuntu. I'm get, app get installing packages. I'm doing all of that stuff. But it's decoupled from the operating system, which is the design we want. So we're doing that with Homebrew uh, because you could use an Ubuntu container. Like it takes just a few seconds to like pull all these down. So it's like, well... Distributions are kind of over for us, right? So if you want to use a SUSE container, you could use that. Uh, people run with an Arch container because there's a bunch of stuff in there that people want. And then Toolbox and DistroBox, which are another set of tools. Sorry, I'm throwing a lot of terminology at you here. Um, you can install graphical applications in there and then they'll like automatically get exported and show up on your desktop and you can pin them on your dock. And there's all this kind of work being done on tools in the space to make the container UX easier for people, uh, which is what we want instead of kind of the traditional distro way is installing all the packages as root oh. you know, on, on your OS. Oh, the days when, when uh, the hardware could only handle a single OS, you know, um, now, now yeah. you have OSs and OSs and OSs, yeah. the OS, OS inception, containerized yeah. OSs, but, so, Michael, there, there's a there's um questions in the in the chat. Should we bring some of those yeah, yeah. up now? Ooh, yeah, Might as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're we're stuff, so we're going to backtrack a little bit. And actually, this first question kind of pairs well with one of mine. Uh, Carlos asking, "Can you swap VS Code for Emacs?" And my question was, you know, coming with VS Code is an opinionated choice. One hundred percent. Yeah. What made you choose VS Code and Dev Containers? And are users stuck with that or? Do they have options to use something else? So it's on the image. The reason is on the image is, is a compromise. And we, we fought with this because we wanted to use the VS Code flat pack with dev containers would make sense. The only problem is, is Microsoft isn't maintaining that. It's like by a third party and it's kind of behind a few versions. And I didn't want to do VS Codium or any, any of that stuff. I wanted real VS Code. Um, so we kind of compromised because we knew we had to make a separate image to add KVM and all the virtualization stuff. Uh, so we picked that. So it's stuck on the image. However, I do want to enable other as many other IDEs as possible. So we have a just shortcut. Uh, just JetBrains will download this thing called the JetBrains toolbox. And then you click, click, click. And then all of those IDEs, all of the dependencies and everything that they have is all self-contained in your home directory. They manage it for you and it, it it's totally decoupled. So I consider our JetBrains and our VS Code experience to be like our best experiences right now. And we're only just now, I'm glad you brought up Emacs because last night I was like, Emacs, dev container support. Is there a plugin? Because I know there's a dev, dev container one for NeoVim. Um, so I, I, I am trying to, um, we are trying to support as many IDEs and all that stuff as possible. It's just tricky because there's that container layer. And if you're used to, you know, app get installing Emacs and that has access and you app get install GCC, right? That's your compiler for Emacs. Whereas in container land, we don't, we don't want to, we don't want a compiler on the host at all. Um, so we're, 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 we're navigating those waters. All right. So we got another one here and this one's from Nuno asking rootless is really a paradigm shift. 
So projects like Bluefin really do help users being introduced to this new way of working. That's not a question. That's a comment and great question, Nuno. Yeah. Great, com great comment, Nuno. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a question right here from Carlo, another one. How is this rootless paradigm similar, different, and or different uh, to, for example, FreeBSD's jail approach? That is a question for someone more technical. I haven't really used BSD in... All right. That's I know right. jails have been around forever, but you know, I'm kind of the Linux nerd using using Docker. Maybe we maybe you uh, find someone in the Discord in in the Bluefin Discord who might be able to help you out with that one. There's a lot of people in there. Yeah. Um, we also have another one here. Let me see. Da, da, da. I'm making sure oh, it looks like Big Pod maybe might have helped answer that question for him in the chat. Um, to what extent does you blue prioritize convenience compared to security? I don't think we Compromise on security. Um, all of our images are signed by SigStore, uh, which is like a nice, there's a SigStore action in GitHub that you should totally use if you're building containers in there. Uh, so we do sign our images and we generate packages. We generate the images every day. So Fedora publishes their, their containers once a day and one hour after uh, all of our automation kicks in. And then we we continuously generate images. So every day you're getting a fresh rebuild, and it's from the ground up uh, of the of the OS. Worst case, there's a 24 hour delay in there. This feature is a beta in Fedora, and I'm hoping as they move to production that they'll publish at a faster rate. Because that's what I really want to do. And do you want to take this follow up from Carlo here, uh, Michael? Yeah. Uh, Kraut says, so if I'm getting this correctly, I can basically get any package from any manager and containerize it. Is that uh, a good summary? Yeah, but that that's that's not something we, that's kind of been around. There's a tool called DistroBox. Hopefully someone will, uh, actually, if we could toss that link in there. Uh, and that's a convenience. That's we a got convenience, Gabe on it now. Yeah, it's a set of convenience bash scripts by this guy, Luca DeMaio, who's going to be at FOSDEM this weekend if you're there. Uh, he kind of wrote a convenience wrapper around both Podman and Docker. And that, you know, you say like DistroBox create Ubuntu and then it pulls the image and it manages it for you. You know, when you type DistroBox upgrade dash A, we'll upgrade them all for you. You can manage them and things like that. Uh, and that is a tool that we heavily leverage. Um, but you can use that on any on any Linux, which is very useful. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a tool that we put front and center uh, in new blue because that's that's what we want people to use and when you use that with the prompt terminal that kind of gives you the gui uh, aspect that lets you manage uh your stuff did we get that link right there George? yep that looks right yep all right perfect it looks like big pot are you familiar with big pot he might yep. also be okay there you go so he has kind of a little bit of a of a comment on on the the question regarding security and he's just saying when it comes to security we're mostly of fedora level we do not go and adjust anything but since we use namespaces based containers there are security benefits to that following yeah. up but there are some debates on how secure user namespaces actually are yeah. so there we go I, I guess the important thing for us to say is we don't mess with Fedora's defaults around security. Like we do SE Linux and all that. Like we don't tell you to turn that off, you know? Uh, so we, we, we always try to follow best practices. Awesome. All right, Michael, should we keep going with our questions now? Great questions, by the way, everyone. Thank you for bringing those forward. And George, thanks for, uh, you know, having answers to them. Um, so I want to bring this back around because we yeah. are on Instant Coffee brought to you by ARM. Yes. So, George, I know when we talked at KubeCon, you were rocking a framework laptop, which is still x86. Yeah. Uh, so my question for you is, what level of support does Bluefin have for running on ARM hardware? I would love to get all of our images running on ARM, like as uh, as fast as possible. Um, a lot of that was kind of waiting for ARM runners uh, to come to GitHub. We did try... Equinex has a great open source program, and we got a builder and things like that, but it was a it's kind of above our level of skill to try and build your own private builder on GitHub public code and doing that in a secure manner and things like that. I would have had to, we would have had to like invest in finding, you know, people who actually know how to do that properly and securely. So for a while we're like, oh, we're not really going to get these until GitHub uh, gets ARM builders, uh, which are coming online, which is really good. So we've, we applied for those early and Eric Curtin, at Red Hat has done some of the work to get Asahi uh, working on Macs. I just need a volunteer to kind of wrap that up. 
I don't I don't know any like they explain 4K pages or whatever that is. It's all Greek to me. Uh, but we're mostly ready to go with ARM. I just need a volunteer to go in there and, and grab it up, and then we'll get it building on on GitHub. It's part of the reason I wanted to come on here. I was like, yeah, this, this I need might, an arm geek to help us out. <laughs> yeah, this might be a great opportunity for us to to kind of like find someone in our community, Michael, uh, uh, who might be interested in supporting something like this. There's a lot of people in the arm discord server, the arm software developers discord mm-hmm. server. And so, you know, we can bring this episode up, you know, talk to them a little bit about this and see what, what who might be interested. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, look. Oh, never mind. Flash my work laptop with Bluefin, though. They might uh, complain about that. So, uh. We'll no, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's for sure. Um, all right. So I, I, I like that. I love it actually that, you know, you're, you're very interested in fact, uh, you know, on your way towards uh bluefin on arm. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of curious. I want to look at, you know, developers who might be watching this right now who have never tried bluefin before and, or developers who, you know, are dealing with a specific vertical or, you know, topic. So is bluefin for all developers? Um, or are there certain developers who might benefit more from Bluefin than others? I think if you're a container nerd, right? Like if you if you're expecting, like if you are if you run Kubernetes clusters and things like that, I kind of want to be your default Linux. Um, I feel like the others, the other parts of development are kind of already well served. You know, like if you have a job and app get installing Nginx is what you do. You know, unless you want to move to containers and it's not it's not really for you, I guess. Um, but what I do want to do is have it as a realistic option for people who want, you know, it's like, oh, my boss says that we're going to move to containerized stuff. I need to start learning that technology is kind of the on-ramp for developers is, is what, I, what I want it to be. You can kind of force it to support a lot of different developer models. Like if you really wanted to, you can grab a container, put it in it. And then kind of do your traditional, I'm going to SSH to a container. There's people who SSH into their containers and stuff. And um, like it, it will do that. Um, but I do feel that for a lot of people that I've been talking to, they're like, man, if I could make a time machine and go back and tell myself, I would start with this. And that's kind of what we're trying to build. Uh yeah, you know what? This the, the, right here, big. Uh, what is it? Sorry, Nuno brings up a good point here, and then it's followed up by Big Pod. Oops, clicked the wrong one. Yeah. Um, Nuno says for ARM, the really good thing is there's already so much containers. This is dating. This is going back to the previous yes. kind of comment on yeah. moving over, moving over to ARM, or at least you know enabling Bluefin on ARM. So yeah. the, the the really good thing is that there's already so much with multi arc, and the workflow can be equal from x eighty uh, x sixty four and ARM in terms of tools used. And then Big Pod says. If I had any ARM hardware like desktop or laptop, Bluefin would probably already work. Uh-huh. <laughs> so so Good to know. it's about just kind of like testing it out now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah because yeah. all it is, it's like when when people multi-arch enabled, you know, the, the first server workloads, that's just what we need. Um, yeah, no, totally. Uh, I mean, so so for, for Carlo's comment here is that, you know, ARM software developers, you guys should hook big pot up with some hardware um we're already working with george on 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 this right now uh you know michael's been kind of working with george i should say uh to see if we can get them some hardware and and start testing this stuff out of course um so it's we're we're on it (laughs) yeah people people do ask about it a lot Uh, especially the cloud nerds are like do you have an arm thing because they want to do local development and the difference is when they're on Macs, especially there's no vm layer because you're talking directly to podman right and mm-hmm. as awesome as those, it feels like every time there's a new chip, the VM overhead kind of gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But it does feel good when you don't have to deal with that VM layer and you're just talking to having the container runtime built into your desktop is what I would call one of the competing advantages of systems like this. And it's it's just great. Um, cool. So George, you're really kind of setting up Bluefin to be the developer desktop, right? Uh, from the software side of things anyway. Yeah. Uh, but whenever I hear the term developer desktop, I think about Barton George and Project Sputnik at Dell and the CS13. Have you, I know Bluefin's still pretty young, but have yeah. you had interest from OEMs or others who are interested in you know, shipping Bluefin on something that they're building or selling? Not, Barton hasn't come out to be like, George, let's get Bluefin rolling on Sputnik. 
Um, Bartman, if you're listening. <laughs> um, but I do have conversations regularly with 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 Matt Hartley at Framework because he's like a Linux fan. He's a big uh, Bluefin fan because we make an image just for the framework because we're trying to tweak tweak the power saving and stuff just right. I think personally, this is a passion project for me. The actual goal of this thing is to get kids into cloud native, right? Like we have a sister project called Bazite, which is just made just like this, but it's more of a gaming thing for Steam Decks and stuff like that. And my my hope is that they come in and they start to learn the technology and then they go, oh, neat. I want a job in this industry. And then they're, they know where to go because they're they're learning the technology just by using their desktop. Like the more you tinker with Bluefin, the better off you'll be when you the first time you try Kubernetes or, or or something like that. That's that's the mantra I'm going with. I think someone will monetize this because all OEMs do have you know image based updates and all that that stuff. So I suspect um, that distributions like Fedora itself, their partnership with Lenovo at some point, you'll just get a thing that looks a lot like this. Um, but for you, it's more, it's an on-ramp. It's not the goal itself. Yeah, I don't want Dell calling me and be like, hey, you know, I, I love, someone, needs, I, someone needs tech support, you know, you kind of broke I, there. <laughs> I love this though, because, because yeah. you know, I want to say certain areas in tech, all areas in tech for that matter, uh, require this kind of lowering of the barrier to entry for some stuff. You yeah. know, when you think like, oh, I want to, who's out there saying like, oh, I want to be a kernel developer. You know, it's like, they're like, right. most people are like being a kernel developer is high barrier to entry. It's intimidating in, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, bringing this barrier to entry down and, and really kind of allowing people to experience something that stepping stone into, yeah. I, yeah. I, I love it. Um, I think that that's really cool. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. And the best part is whatever comes next, because everything is being built on cloud native, like you get it for, for so I, I was, I was at an all hands and there's, there's people doing stuff with LLMs. Right. And I see this demo and they're running it locally and it's like, awesome. I was like, man, I'm never going to get that. How do I get that thing running on my laptop? And I walked up to the speaker and they're like, check it out. Here are the dev containers. And I pasted them into my VS code. Boom. I have it. So all of this AI stuff, every time you read about an open source model, Olama is like a tool that I have on all my machines now so I can start playing with that stuff. So it, it you know, we're, I'm trying to, that's like the purpose of Bluefin, you know, is to, is to get those people the opportunities to get into open source as early as possible in, in the process. Awesome. So Michael, we're getting to the top of the hour. I think you still have a few more questions though, right? Yeah, keep them coming. Uh, I, I think we hit on most of them now. Um... Like you talked about DevBox, you talked about uh, Homebrew, and so I, like I was surprised I didn't know Homebrew was uh, for Linux. I always thought it was it's just so that. good. It is yeah. so good. Yeah, I think a lot of people they because their first experience is like, oh, it compiles a bunch of stuff. There's like a bunch of Ruby stuff. It puts stuff in weird places on your Linux system as your Linux, your inner Linux alarm goes off. Says, hey, uh -huh. wait a minute, stuff is supposed to go in slash home slash Linux brew. So if we containerize it for you and we use Wolfie OS, which is a distroless. Uh, package system and we give you a, a kind of empty container with all the goodies in there uh, it does doesn't touch your host so when you break it you just throw it away and you generate a new one rinse and repeat as often as you want that's nice yeah it is nice very so, cool for people listening um i know a lot of them are already uh using bluefin and part of your community <laughs> but for those who aren't how what's the easiest way for somebody to get started trying this out yeah, so come to our forums, uh, the websites, the URLs that we that we posted here. We're still in beta. We're hoping to go final sometime after Fedora 40 comes out. So a lot a lot of the technology and stuff we don't we don't write. We're kind of we're the UPS person. We're not we don't really develop, you know, the package is Fedora's. So uh, you know, a lot of it we do the same thing everyone else does. We sit there and we hit F5 waiting for the things to get accepted into Fedora and then when they do we just naturally get them or we integrate them. And once we get an installer, I think it's going to be when I really ask people to try it. Because right now that's a tough barrier to entry. And you know, this act, it sounds like this is what it, you, you, you guys were synced on this one right here. Cause after story says, in my experience, Bluefin being my first distro, the installation presented a minor inconvenience, but the subsequent usage proved to be an exceptionally seamless. And you just is amazing. So I, I think that, you know, uh, uh, that's awesome. After story went through it, 
got to yeah. got to the point and now he's loving it right yeah so once it's on there it's good for the life <clears throat> of the heart. like it maintains itself like how cool is that story too <clears throat> like you were this person's first linux distro we got that a lot with ubuntu but that wasn't our distro yeah. like this is your this is your thing yeah because we're trying to get we're trying to get that chromebook level of i don't have to mess with it right you open your chromebook it's never bo- it never bothers you with stuff right where like traditional linux is always like oh no i've got a depackage reconfigure hey i got mm-hmm. i haven't seen that command and I, I don't i don't even remember so yeah you know, well so we shooting for yeah awesome so we we are at the top of the hour here george um this is kind of when we start closing out and mm-hmm. giving you an opportunity to make your shameless plug so do you have anything you'd like to share with anyone watching now live or on demand later yeah so uh as i've been strongly hinting before the the, the purpose like there's going to be tech and there's going to be linux system. i'm not expecting everyone to be like hey i'm going to switch over to linux distro i think that ship probably sailed a while a while back but you know if you have a spare computer or or you're into development or you have a really powerful computer like a thread ripper and you want an awesome unix workstation uh you know come come help us out and that's the kind of model that that we're we're shooting for is to to be an alternative that's actually modern reliable and can compete with proprietary operating systems but also be an on ramp for people to get into like i want to see people who start at, when you get in the industry, Michael, people say, hey, you know, Ubuntu was my first Linux 15 years ago or whatever. Uh, it, it, I kind of want to do that, but for cloud native, you know, it's, it's kind of that, you know. Yeah, having that all just locally on your laptop, especially as you're just learning and you don't want to, you know, sign up for cloud services or pay for you know, Kubernetes deployments out there on something. Having yeah. that all local to play with is a really important thing, especially for students. Like students don't have money to spend on cloud oh, services. Labs and stuff are, is, is going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, cool. George, well, thank you so much. Um, I would like to once again mention to everyone, head on over to, let's click that. Let's show that little link there. Gabe, you don't mind. Projectbluefin.io. Sure. Go check it out. Everything we covered today will, of course, be included in the description below. So if you're watching on demand, make sure you just cruise on down to that description. Whenever you hear a link or see a link pop up on the screen, we'll make sure that it's clickable and usable down below. Um, And uh, I would like to also talk about next week's episode. Michael, what is next week's episode? Uh, Who do we have next week? Let's see. Let me check my my list here. I think we... Yeah, so uh, we put it in. It's a deep dive with Bo Paisley. Examining Linux uh, Lenaro Forge. All uh, right, Lenaro Forge. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. So we've had folks from Lenaro on before. They're usually really fun to hang out with. Um, I'm sure you'll love talking about what you're hearing about Lenaro Forge with Bo. It's a it's a HPC tools. Uh, lots of other um, components there that will help people who are dealing in the HPC space. Um, but for the time being, for, uh, George, one more time, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Me. Yeah, I know. Uh, and everyone watching, gosh, uh, I say this all the time, but you, you could have spent this hour doing so many other things and you spent it here with us and we're very grateful for you doing that. So uh, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. We do go live every single Thursday, um, 5 p.m. UTC. And uh, uh, join us next there. Join us next time. Join I didn't our know Discord. there was a Discord. I'm, I'm going to be in there. I would be hanging out there the whole time. We We have a specific channel just for uh, desktop and Linux use on ARM. So uh, if you start getting uh, Bluefin working on uh, a MacBook or a Lenovo or anything else that's running uh, an ARM CPU, please let us know there in that channel so we can uh, check it out. Very cool. Yes. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you hit that like button and also subscribe to the ARM Software Developers YouTube channel. We're closing out now. Gentlemen, have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you. Take care. Everyone watching. Bye. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.